G'day, in today's video we'll be having a look at the fuel surge problem that gets real old real quick when performance driving your BRZ slash Toyota 86 details are next. I'm Mark Louth from Black Dog Motorsport and if you or somebody you know has the Black Dog chasing them there are some links in the description which you may find useful. Righto, fuel surge, what is it, can I fix it, and will it cost a fortune? Fuel surge in the twins is caused when the fuel migrates away from the pickup of the fuel pump. The cause of this phenomena is usually a combination of the fuel level and the cornering loads, especially when turning left. Now the higher the G load and the longer the duration of the corner, the bigger the problem. This is the fuel tank out of a first gen BRZ, the 2019 model to be exact. Now, as you can see, the tank has a big depression in the middle. Now, this is to clear the tail shaft. Right, oh, just out in the shed on the mobile phone, what you're looking at there is the fuel tank out of one of these cars. And you can see that there's two great big holes, one here, one here in the top of the tank. Now, you'd think that that's for twin fuel pumps, and it's not. This one here, which is empty, is for a fuel uh, level sensor because there's actually a fuel level sensor attached to the fuel pump assembly and a second one on this side because of the cutout in the centre of the tank for the tail shaft assembly. But watch this. do this one-handed but you get the general idea mmm twin fuel pumps now while mounting the second fuel pump may be as simple as that getting it to work without unleashing Armageddon on the engine management system and the fact that the pump discharge would need to be plumbed into the existing fuel system means it kinda ain't as simple as that I'm going to leave the plumbing for another video and concentrate on the first part of the wiring up issue in this video, which is a bit of a saga. In fact, I probably won't get through it all in one go, as it is a bit of a process. Modern cars run what is known as a CAN bus system. Now, without going down that particular rabbit hole, suffice it to say that if you change something or anything in the electrical system, the module that looks after that system will notice that change and it will interpret that change as a fault and throw a fault code as a result. Now to prevent that from happening, any changes made to the system must be invisible to that system and that is not something that is easy to do. I went down to my local Subaru dealer to get hold of the fuel system wiring diagram so I could see how the system works but they were, well, less than helpful. I say so love being treated like I'm an idiot. Well, screw you dipshits, I'll do it myself, and you lot are invited along for the ride. Now, the first and most important thing then is to test exactly what happens when the pump is operating. And to do that, we need to build a test fixture. So let's make one. What we have here is a schematic drawing of a test fixture. Fixture, I'll spit it out, that I'd like to make in order to find out what's actually going on when the fuel pump is running. So I'll just quickly run you through it. What I have here are four screw terminals. This will be on a, on a printed circuit board if I didn't say that already. This is the input from the engine management system. I'll just get rid of that. There we go, that's better. So pins one and two are the power and the ground wires for the um, running physical running of the pump itself. Pins three and four are for the fuel quantity or fuel tank level sender. So they just go straight through as you can see. Now the first test point we have here is for an oscilloscope. So we have the probe that goes on this one and this one here is the grounding wire for the oscilloscope probe. Now that will show what sort of power is actually flowing in the circuit, whether it's a direct DC, which I strongly suspect that it is, um, or whether it's a square wave, in, in other words, pulse wave modulated. So I'm hoping it's direct DC, 
that will make my life a lot easier. But if it's not, it's not the end of the world. Second test fixture is uh, test point three and test point six, and that is to measure the amperage or the current flow. And that is why it is an open circuit between the two. As you can see, there is no conductor between these two test points because when you're measuring amperage, for those of you who are not aware, the measuring meter, the measuring device, needs to be connected in series with the load. So it actually be completes the circuit through the meter as it's doing its measuring. And voltage measurements is across or in parallel to the load. So we have our power here and our ground here. All right, let's have a look what the actual board will look like. So just to give you a bit of an indication, the board will be around about, this is just a little measuring application here, 105 millimeters long. And whoops. I'll get it right in a second, hang on. It's not like anybody's watching, you know. There we go. It is 25 millimeters wide, so what's that? Four inches by one inch. Okay, now, as you can see, the um, looks a bit funny there because there's actually writing on both sides of the board. This is what you do if you're actually sending this board away to be manufactured, which I probably, well, I won't be doing. I, um, I'll just make one at home, but just for the exercise because it allows us to do this and have a bit of a preview of what the board will look like without all the fancy writing, of course, once it is manufactured. And there are the pro points there. I don't actually have a 3D drawing of the um, screw terminals, but you get the rough idea. There, flip it over. This program that I'm using, by the way, is actually free. It's called KiCad, K-I-C-A-D, and I paid $26.50, I think it was, to do a course on Udemy on how to use it. And let me tell you, it is awesome. If you do anything with electronics, then this thing is pretty cool. Okay, so that's what the board hopefully will look, something very similar to that when, when we build it. And that is our drawing and got all the little flashies and got all the details there. Uh, righto, let's go and build it. After selecting the parts I need from the circuit board layout, namely the solder pads and the tracks, I print them out on a piece of high gloss paper using a laser printer. Now an inkjet printer will not work and you must use a laser printer. Now, after trimming down the printout to roughly a, the final size, you don't get too carried away, I'm going to select a piece of blank circuit board. I'm using standard everyday FR4 uh, blank board and when selecting a piece to use, try and find one close to the finished size of the board just to cut down on the waste. Now before going any further, I'm going to start heating up the etching compound uh, as it works significantly better when there's a bit of heat on board. Now, don't go overboard here, 60 to 70 degrees uh, centigrade is plenty. I'm using the heater bed of this 3D printer, however, placing the container in hot water in the sink works reasonably well also. The etchant that I'm using is ferric oxide. Now, look, this stuff is toxic and stains literally anything and everything that it even looks like coming into contact with. Hence the reason the wax paper is over the bed of the printer. In fact, this stuff stains so well, merely the act of moving past something will turn it yellow. Okay, while the etching is heating up, it's time to prepare a blank piece of FR4 circuit board so we can transfer the toner from the paper to the board. This method is called, rather imaginatively, the toner transfer method. 
First off, I'll trim the board to its rough shape and size, and I'll come back after the board is etched and tinned and bring the board down to its final size. But for now, it's just a case of bringing the board size down to a more manageable dimension. Back inside now, it's time to sand the board with some wet and dry sandpaper to remove any stains and or oxidisation from the surface of the copper layer. This is done to help with the transfer of the toner from the paper to the copper surface. Quick clean up with some isopropyl alcohol just to remove any waxes and grease fingerprints and that sort of hoo-ha that may prevent the toner from adhering to the surface of the board. And um, then just place the paper face down onto the surface of the board and then fix it in place with some tape. The next step is to transfer the toner to the board by heating up the surface with the iron. Now I also use the laminator as it applies an even pressure to the board, however it doesn't get hot enough on its own, or at least mine doesn't, which is why I also use the iron. The piece of board you see here is, is not our test fixture, as some idiot who shall remain nameless forgot to press record, so this is a prototype board for another project I'm working on at the moment. Now that that's done, you can soak the board in some water to soften the paper. Now make sure the paper is soaked all the way through, otherwise if you try and take the paper off too soon, it will lift the toner from the board, which sort of defeats the purpose. Clean the surface with an old toothbrush once the paper has been removed, and that will take any leftover bits of paper that are stuck to the toner off. Okay, cool. Now it's time to drill the holes. Now, make sure to drill the holes before you etch the board, as I find if you do it after the toner that forms the solder pads and the pads themselves can lift off the board when you try and drill them. Right, using the correct PPE, unlike me, place the board into the ferric oxide and start the etching process. Now, if you look closely, as closely at this stuff, you can see it bubbling away and off-gassing. And while I'm a bit slack when it comes to the wearing of gloves and etc., in all seriousness, you do not want to breathe this shit in, so use your brain. This sequence shows the process when it's nearly at its end and as you can see the copper layer is super thin, however the toner and therefore the copper underneath is untouched. After the etching process is complete we will need to tin the copper track. Now this aids in the soldering process and it protects the copper from corrosion. And to achieve this, I'll be using this stuff here. It's called a liquid tin, and it also works better if it is heated. So I'm going to pop it on the heater bed at the same time. It's now time for the board to come out of the etching. And as you can see, all the unwanted copper has been etched away, and our circuit tracks are left behind underneath the toner. Thorough clean off in some fresh water and we're ready to remove the toner. The 
The simplest way to achieve the removal of the toner is by wiping it down with some acetone and uh, there ladies and gentlemen is our printed circuit board. All that is required now is to tin the copper. I left it a little late to start warming the liquid tin so it took a little bit longer to work than usual but if you watch closely you can see the copper changing colour. Okay, the last step is to remove the board from the solution, rinse it off and there it is, our custom made PCB for our custom made test fixture. Now this is what it all looks like after all the components have been soldered in and the wiring installed. And in the last set of slides you'll see here is the mock-up of the fixture installed between the pump and the OEM wiring. Okay, that will do for this one. It has dragged on long enough. Now listen, in part two we will install this fixture into the car, hook up all of the test equipment and take some measurements so we can see exactly what is actually going on in the system. This will then give us all the info we need to design the wiring and control system to run the two pumps without the engine management system knowing anything has changed and that is the key. The ECM or ECU or whatever term you wish to use must not know that anything has changed. Now if you would like to be notified when that video goes live please consider subscribing. It is free and as always thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye for now.